most important thing. So I am going to make him the host here and let him take over here shortly. All right, so Christopher, you're now the host, so you can mute and unmute and all that if you need to. So anyway, Christopher is the uh, president of the Inspiro uh, Financial, which does our loans and things for us. And so excited to have him come and share with you guys some things about mortgage to get you started and ready to rock and roll in terms of your business. So with that, I'll turn it over to Christopher and you can uh, take over from here. But you're muted. You're still muted though. There we go. Sorry about that. Is that better? Can you hear me now? Well, you're unmuted, but I can't hear you. I don't know if, if everybody else, is anybody hearing him? I can hear him. Okay, I must can. be just me. You're good to go then. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Good to see you. Um, looks like we've got a handful of people on the call. It's always great to teach this class. Welcome to uh, our class on the mortgage process. Sorry, my, my presentation is jumping all over there. Um, hopefully you can all see that. Um, can you give me a thumbs up or just a yes, you can see it? Yes, I can see it. Wonderful. Um, we're going to be talking today uh, about the mortgage process. I'm not sure what level of experience you all have with, uh, with lending. Um, can you all give me just a quick breakdown? Is this a, 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 are you new agents, experienced agents? Tell me a little bit more about you. I'm a new agent, Jesse. Okay. Just speaking. <laughs> I'm a new agent. <laughs> Good. That was, and that was, uh, who was that? That was Jesse Unsworth. Jesse, then we got, okay, Jesse, thank you. Then we got Nicole and Jimmy and Marissa and Monica, Kyle, JCC, and Corbin Hyde. I'm assuming, sorry, I'm assuming you all are, are new agents as well. Um, and today we're going to spend some time kind of going through the mortgage process, you know, as agents. Um, that's a huge part of what you're going to be doing is dealing with the mortgage and the lending aspect of things. Um, we are the affiliate lender for, for Everest. So we do tons and tons of business. We're located in all the Everest locations here in Utah and California um, with fantastic uh, loan officers. And so we're here to help you with whatever you need. But today, um, it's just to kind of give you a little bit of understanding of what your clients go through. Uh, what do they go through? What is the mortgage process? How does it work? Um, what, uh, what are they gonna, uh, I thank you all for putting information in the chat box. Appreciate that. Um, what, what is it that they go through? Because the more, you know, the better agent you're going to be, um, and it's going to help them go through and navigate this experience, which can be quite daunting and scary for most people as this is the biggest purchase they've ever made in their life and probably will be. So we're going to spend the next hour or two going through, going through this. Um, a lot of information, um, but let's just kind of go through some of the things that you're going to be learning today uh, as we go through this. Um, you're going to learn what a mortgage is. We'll talk what that, about what exactly is a mortgage. Uh, the basics that's, uh, that is required for your clients to get pre-approved for a mortgage. Um, what their experience is, is like after you found them a home and they're under contract. What is it they go through? What are we going to ask them or any lending institution is going to ask them to do? Uh, and then finally, we any ask questions ask questions ask questions um i don't want to be a talking head although i'll do a lot of talking today if you have questions as we go through this there's no silly question this may be new for a lot of you as well and that's okay um, so there's no silly question or dumb question don't be embarrassed uh, you can just speak up you can put something in the chat box uh, any questions that you have as we go through this don't hesitate to ask those okay is that a deal um the outline, here's what we're gonna talk about um, in our outline today. We're gonna to talk about, again, what a mortgage is. Um, we're gonna talk about um, what your clients need to do to prepare for mortgage financing. We're gonna talk about some definitions and terms that you need to be aware of that you're gonna hear a lot throughout your career when it comes to lending. We're gonna talk about the different types of mortgage loans that are out there. Um, what, uh, what are the out-of-pocket expenses your clients can expect when they um, start the mortgage process? Because there are a few that they may have to incur. And then we're going to talk through the, the four steps of getting the loan, getting pre-approved, house hunting, the documentation stage, and then uh, the closing and funding stage. And then we'll end up with any Q&A um, if uh, we haven't already gone through those during the presentation. 
So what, what is a mortgage? Um, let's, let's talk about what is exactly a mortgage. You hear that term a lot. Well, what is it? You know, what is a mortgage loan? Um, it's a loan for real estate. You, you all know that a mortgage is a loan that is secured for someone to buy a house or refinance an existing house uh, for real estate, whether that's a single family home, a fourplex, commercial, um, makes no difference. Um, a mortgage is a loan to buy real estate. Um, it's also a financial instrument that's secured against the property. It's, it's called the promissory notes. That's the financial piece of paper um, that secures that particular loan. A mortgage is just like a stock. If you think about when you buy a stock, let's say you went, out, you went to your Merrill Lynch account and you wanted to buy a piece of IBM stock. In the old days, they'd actually give you a piece of paper right, that says you have one share of stock. Um, and that you own an, I, an IBM and you could buy and trade and sell that stock uh, depending on the price of the, of the market. A mortgage is the exact same thing. It's a, a note, it's a financial, it's an actual piece of paper. It's a financial instrument that can be bought and sold and traded on Wall Street. Mortgage loans, that's what happens to mortgage loans when they go to live and die is on Wall Street. And you want to think of a mortgage just like you think of a piece of stock. It's no different. Um, and investors can buy those promissory notes uh, as investments because they are really good investments because people make their payments and they have a guaranteed interest rate. That's the interest rate on the loan. So that's what a mortgage is. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so there, as you saw that it's similar to a stock that can be sold and traded. Um, it's usually amortized over 30 years, meaning the loan and amortized meaning how long is the loan, how long is the loan good for? How many years do you have to pay it off? Your car loans are three, five, seven, six years that you guys have on your car loans. 30 uh, mortgage loans traditionally are 30 years is the standard loan. But there are other terms that uh, they, they come in five-year increments starting at 10 years and up to 30 years. You can get different loan increments depending on the borrower and what they want to do. It's totally up to them. Uh, payments are due the first of every month and considered late um, the 15th of the month. Um, that's pretty standard on all mortgage loans, um, that they're due the first first team. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm just joining. I apologize. Great. Now, before I go, any, any questions about what a mortgage loan is, how it works, um, what a promissory note is? A promissory note, again, it's an actual piece of paper that the borrower signs at closing. That's what secures the loan against the property. That promissory note is just like a piece of stock that's bought and sold and traded. It doesn't have any impact on the consumer. They don't know that that happens, um, but mortgage loans are bought and sold and traded on Wall Street just like, um, just like pieces of stock are because they have value. Because mortgage loans, people tend to pay on time. There's very little delinquency in the United States on loans. It's less than um, 3% that people are delinquent on their loans. So it's a good investment, a good return for people that want something that's uh, that's kind of guaranteed. Yes. I, I had a quick question. Yeah. So the note is what the borrower gets when they sign the mortgage, correct? The, bar, the borrower doesn't get the note. The note, they sign the note at the closing table at the very end of the transaction when they're signing all their final stuff. One of the documents is a note. And that note is an actual document that gets recorded at the county to show that XYZ mortgage company has a lien against this property. So you bought a house for, let's say you bought a house for hundred thousand, there's no such thing. Let's say you bought a house for hundred thousand uh, dollars and they got an $80,000 loan. There's a promissory note for $80,000 that XYZ mortgage company has against that house. They, they technically own the property, right? Your borrower is considered the owner, the owner of record, but the bank technically owns the, the house, just like the bank technically owns your car because they have a loan on it. That promissory okay. note is what secures that. It tells everybody who owns that 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 note, who owns the promissory note, and that note stays with the note holder. It does not stay with the borrower. Um, the borrower doesn't get the note is paid off in 30 years and goes away. Um, so it's not a the note is not something the borrower ever holds. It's recorded against the county and then it's bought and sold and traded on Wall Street. Okay, great. That makes sense. Thank you. Yes, that makes sense. Thank you, Christopher. Good question. Any other questions about what a mortgage loan is? Okay. Um, so let's talk about preparing for mortgage financing your clients. Um, you know, 
your clients need to make sure they understand and manage their credit properly. This is a huge uh, part of the things that we look at when we're looking for someone's uh, pre-qualifications criteria is what does their credit look like? They need to understand what their credit is and make sure they're managing it the, the right way. They need to make sure they're maintaining a solid history and they begin to save money. These are, things, these are some of the first things that we're gonna ask someone we talk to, but these are some of the, the things that you can do when you're pre-qualifying your clients. When you have a buyer that wants to work with you, some of the basic questions you ought to be asking is, do you know how was your credit? Do you know what it looks like? Do you know what your credit score is? Do you have credit? Um, are you currently working? Believe it or not, you gotta have a job to buy a house. <laughs> Um, unless you're retired and have plenty of money and get social security and have investments. Um, you need to, they need to begin to start to save some money because they're likely going to need a down payment um, for um, a house. There are, some down, there are some no down payment programs, but those are tough to qualify for, so they need to save some money. Um, those are some of the pre-qualification questions you want to ask them. But before you start working with the client, the biggest piece of advice I can give you is make sure your clients are pre-approved before you start working with them, before you start spending time. The last thing you wanna do is spend hours and hours and hours with the client, sending them listings, showing them properties, start starting to make offers, and then all of a sudden you get under contract and oh my gosh, we gotta get them a, a, a mortgage and you send it to the mortgage company. The mortgage company looks at their credit, their income, and they say, hey, you know what? They don't qualify for a house because of they have bad credit or they don't have a good work history or they don't have any money for a down payment. You just wasted days and hours and weeks with this client that you thought was good to go, but only to find out at the very end that they're not. Um, so that's de that definitely is a rookie mistake that happens a lot. You'll get a, someone that's very anxious to buy a house. And you're super eager to work with them and you want to help them and you start doing all this work. Um, and, and you're really spinning your wheels and wasting your time if you don't get them pre-approved first before you spend any time. Most really good agents will tell a buyer, listen, I love to work with you. You're awesome. I can't wait to help you and your family, but my time is valuable just like your time is valuable, and I require all my clients to be pre-approved before I even start competing with them because we want to make sure that we're not looking at homes that are too expensive or not expensive enough for you. And we want to make sure that all your ducks are in a row because this is a very competitive market. It's a seller's market. But we need to make sure that you are strong financially and have your loan in place and ready to go before you really start looking at homes. Are you okay with that? If so, here's a couple of referrals I want to give you to get pre-approved. Pre um, highly encourage you to do that before your clients start doing anything. Yes, Jesse. Uh, what does the pre-approval process look like? So when we have a buyer, we just send them to you and you start that process? Yeah, we'll go through that. Um, but a pre-approval process is you just want to give them the contact information of one of our LOs. Um, where are you, Jesse? Are you at, where, where, where do you live? Uh, Simi Valley, the Wood Ranch okay, office. Valley. Yeah, so we've got, a, we've got great LOs that service that office. We've got um, a half a dozen loan officers in Ventura County that are fantastic. Um, and you can contact their office there or shoot me an email and I'll connect you with them. Um, and they will reach out to your client. You don't need to do anything other than just passing our information along, either to your client, to call us, or better yet, reaching out to one of our loan officers, and our loan officer will be proactive and reach out to your client to get them pre-approved. Um, okay. And we'll go through what that what that means. What what, is, okay. what does it mean to get pre-approved? What is it your client is going through to get to have that process? It doesn't take a long time, um, depending on how responsive your client is. Um, it can happen in a day, because there's documentation we need to get back from them. Uh, sometimes it can take a few days, depending on how responsive your client is, because we want to make sure that they are, when you get a pre-approval from Inspiro, you know they're good to go and you can trust it, you can rely on it, um, and go out with confidence to show them properties. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Great question. Hey, Chris. Yeah. Um, I have one more question on that, actually. Yep. Can you turn it down a little bit? Yeah. Uh, when you, um, oh my God, I just spaced in the question. When you're doing the pre-approval and you're going to pass off the information to the uh, the, the Inspiro agent, uh, yep. do you have to ask permission to the client? Like, do you mind if I give your information to one of our uh, it's usually a good idea. lenders and have them reach out to you? Or do you just kind of give it to them and have them reach out? Great question. Um, it's usually more of a statement than a question. Um, you can approach it how you want. You can ask them, are you okay with, but again, you're, you're the real estate agent, you're in control. You want to kind of lead your clients down this path. They want to look to you as the source for information because most of them have never done this or done it very infrequently. And you want to be the person of authority, the person that they trust. 
And so usually what the, a good agent will do is say, listen, the first step is for us to get you pre-approved on the mortgage process because so I want to work with you. Um, but I require all my clients to get pre-approved first. I'm going to have one of my top loan officers reach out to you here in the next 24 hours. Um, his or her name is blah, 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 right, whatever. Um, and I'm going to call them on your cell phone. Just want to make sure that you're aware of that and okay with it. Sure, no problem. Great. Okay. Right? So you're kind of leading them a horse to water, so to speak, rather than begging and asking for permission. Got it. Makes sense. Yep. That's a good question. All right. Um, let's go into some mortgage definitions in terms of as we go through this and explain what the mortgage process is. A few things that you're going to want to know and understand that you're going to hear a lot. Um, and a lot of these are acronyms that you're going to hear. We, we love acronyms in the mortgage lending world um, and in real estate. So you already know a bunch um, in, in, as far as real estate is concerned. But let's go over some mortgage definitions and terms. Um, LTV. LTV stands for loan to value. That means how much um, of a loan are they needing in relationship to the purchase of the house? So again, back to our example, if the house was $100,000 and they're going to put $20,000 down, so they're getting an $80,000 loan, that means they have an 80% LTV, an 80% loan to value. It's the percentage of their loan versus what the purchase price is. LTV is a big factor in what kind of stuff, what people qualify for. Um, what kind of loan they can secure, what kind of interest rate they get. LTV is a big part of that process. So you'll hear that a lot um, when it comes to lending. APR, annual percentage rate. Um, you see this is a federal required term um, that you see on any kind of financing loan that you get, whether it's a, lo a, car, a house loan, a car loan, a student loan, an annual percentage rate. It's very confusing. It is not the interest rate that the borrower secures with their financing. The annual percentage rate takes all the costs associated with any type of loan and adds it on top of the loan amount and then re-amortizes it over the term of the loan. And that sounds like a super confusing formula, and it is. It's probably the worst um, document that the federal government came up with when any kind of financing because it's very confusing because the annual percentage rate is always higher than their actual rate. Someone's mortgage loan rate may be 2.5%. But the annual percentage rate of the APR may be 3%. And they think, my gosh, I thought you told me my rate was 2.5%. That is your rate. The APR does other things. It factors in the cost of the loan. The whole purpose of the APR is to tell everyone it's not free to secure a loan. There's a cost associated with getting a loan, whether it's a car, a house, a student loan, a credit card, whatever. And that's what the APR shows. But don't ever confuse the APR with what the actual interest rate is for that borrower. PMI versus MIP. PMI stands for private mortgage insurance. MIP stands for mortgage insurance premium. They're the exact same thing. Um, but what it is, is it's, a, it's an insurance policy that sits on top of someone's loan in addition to their normal house insurance. The federal requirements um, for lending are that if you put less than 20% down, so if your loan to value is greater than 80%, you have to, by federal law, have what's called mortgage insurance or private mortgage insurance. And it's an additional insurance policy that does not protect the client from anything. It protects the mortgage company from default. So a PMI policy or mortgage insurance policy protects the mortgage insurance company should the borrower ever default on their house and they stop making payments. They, get, they recoup some of that loss. And it's required anytime someone puts less than 20% down on a house. And the amount of insurance just depends on a bunch of factors. It depends on their interest rate. It depends on their credit score. It depends on how big their loan is. But private mortgage insurance or MIP can be anywhere from 50 bucks a month, $300 a month. It just depends. Um, so it's a big additional part of someone's payment if they put less than 20% down. But you'll hear those words, PMI and MIP, and they're interchangeable. It's the same term. DTI stands for debt to income ratio. We're going to go over this in greater detail in a future slide when we talk about the pre-qualification process, but this just talks about how much debt they have in relationship to their income, but I'll show you exactly what that means, but you'll hear DTI quite often. Hazard insurance. Hazard insurance is another term for the homeowner's insurance, not to be confused with the mortgage, private mortgage insurance from two lines above. This is... Hazard insurance is insurance that does protect the homeowner in case of a fire or theft or damage or injury. This is just like your car insurance if you get into an accident. Hazard insurance is the insurance on the home for the homeowner, which is required on every house somebody buys. 
points or discount points. These are additional fees that people pay um, on top of their loan to get a lower interest rate. Um, we, we quote interest rates all the time for clients. This is what the rate is today. This is what it was yesterday. This is what we think it's gonna be tomorrow. Um, interest rates are living, breathing things. They change all the time. They're constantly in flux. And we quote a rate that's available to a borrower that does not cost them anything extra to secure that rate. But let's say the rate today was for at 3%, just to have a nice easy, easy number. They're lower than that, but let's just say they're at 3%. A borrower could actually secure 2.75 if they wanted to, if they paid what are called points or discount points. They paid a fee to get a lower rate. Um, it's very expensive to do that. It's always an option for a borrower if they'd like to do that. Um, and we review that with them to see if it makes financial sense. But you'll hear that term points or discount points. And in Spira, we do not charge them out of the gate. Some companies do, we do not. Um, but you just need to be aware of what it is because your clients may ask you that. An ARM stands for an adjustable rate mortgage. Uh, most mortgages are fixed mortgages, meaning the, the interest rate for the loan is fixed for the life of the loan. You get that 3% and it's fixed for 30 years, it never changes. And an, an, an ARM or an adjustable rate mortgage, that's not the case. The rate may be fixed for the first five years and then the remaining 25 years, it could potentially adjust every single year with some parameters and restrictions. So you'll hear that term ARM. We, don't, we do very few ARMs these days because uh, the fixed interest rates are the lowest they've ever been in the history of the United States. No one really wants to do an adjustable rate mortgage. And again, stop me with any questions as we go through this. An LE versus a CD. LE stands for a loan estimate. A CD stands for a closing disclosure. These are the initial and the final documents that we have to provide every borrower when we start the process. And these are, and they should match and correlate. Those two documents are kind of the financial synopsis of what their loan looks like. It goes over their interest rate, the terms of the loan, and then all the closing costs associated with their loan. We have to provide that to a borrower within three days of them going under contract at the start of the contract, at the start of the process. And then we have to provide it to them within three days of them actually signing and closing at the end of the process. They're gonna get two sets of documents at the beginning and at the end of the whole loan process um, and they will compare the loan estimate to the closing disclosure. They should be very similar. There should be very little difference between the two because um, we know what things are costing and it protects the consumer that a mortgage company isn't trying to overcharge them or take advantage of them in any way. But these are initial and final disclosures that the federal government requires that we send out every time a borrower is buying a house or refinancing. Uh, the, the loan estimate you're not so concerned with doesn't really matter. The CD or the closing disclosure, that's something that does matter because that's the final document that lists all the final details. It will list your commission. It will list any lender credits. It will list homeowners transfer fees, HOA transfer fees if it's a town, home, or condo. So that's something that you will get a copy of from the title or escrow company to let you know what things look like. And that's something that you ought to look at and preview and make sure that you're familiar with. Whether someone is getting a loan or paying cash, you want to make sure that you're reviewing the CD. An origination, that's a fee assessed by a lender for securing a loan. Um, historically, lenders chart, would charge up to 1% of the loan amount in an origination fee. That, that practice has since kind of gone away. and It's usually just a flat amount that most lenders charge. And in Spira Financial, we charge a flat 1290 fee. That's our, that's our sole fee that we charge on our loans is $1,290, very low because of our relationship with Everest, we wanna keep it very low and competitive for your clients. Um, but that's a fee that the lender charges. As I mentioned before, loans aren't free. We have to charge a little bit for our services. Um, and that's the fee that the lender charges. Some companies and some particularly credit unions and banks continue to charge a 1% fee. So if it's a $300,000 loan, that's a $3,000 origination fee. If it's a $700,000 loan, it's a $7,000 origination fee. It can get very expensive. Um, it's just like comparing a credit card that has an annual fee versus a credit card that doesn't have an annual fee. We do not charge an origination fee. We simply have a flat lender fee that's much better for the consumer. Escrow. Um, there are two definitions of what escrow means. Uh, in California, escrow is the process of when you've started the contract, you have, a, you have the, the contract signed, um, and you turn that in as well as an earnest money deposit to an escrow company, and you open escrow. It means you're under a contract, the process is starting, things are moving forward. 
Um, that's a California term. That is not what escrow means in other states. Uh, and in Utah, we do not open escrow the same way. Um, but that's what escrow means in California for the California realtors. But the second definition applies to everyone in every state. Escrow has to do with an amount of money that is collected for the borrower's taxes and insurance. It's called an escrow account. Part of someone's house payment includes the property taxes and the insurance that they have to pay on a monthly basis for the house. Um, and, and an escrow account is created um, to pay those things for the borrower. Um, and you'll, so you'll hear that term a lot. You have to set up money for an escrow account. That's, that's funds that we have to collect from the borrower to make sure their property taxes and insurance on the property are paid on time um, throughout the year. Locking. Locking means when we secure the rate on the loan. Uh, just like it says, once we lock in an interest rate, that rate will not change. It's, it's fast, it's not going anywhere. Um, and as I mentioned before, interest rates are living, breathing things and they can kind of fluctuate a little bit over the course of a mortgage transaction. Uh, but once we lock it in, it does not matter what happens, that rate is secure. So whether the market goes up or down, the borrower is fixed and locked into that rate and it protects their interest. They don't have to worry about the fluctuations in the market. Uh, we typically lock in a loan right away to make sure that those borrower can be at ease and at rest with their loan. PTI, or excuse me, PITI is an acronym for principal interest taxes and insurance. Those are the four parts of every mortgage payment, the principal and interest on the loan plus the taxes and insurance uh, that we need for the escrow account. That's, that, those are the four parts of every mortgage loan that can constitute a borrower's total house payment. So when someone says, what's your house payment? It's $1,000 a month. Well, of that $1,000, maybe $750 are principal and interest. Another $200 could be taxes. And another $50 could be the insurance for a total of $1,000. So PITI is the full payment that someone pays on their mortgage every month. FHA and VA, these are two government agencies that administer loans. Um, they are very common for veterans and for first time home buyers. They're fantastic loans, but you'll hear those terms FHA and VA, they have different requirements than other types of loans. And we'll go into what these loans mean in a minute, but these are two acronyms that you uh, need to make sure that you're aware of. Any questions about the, the acronyms or the definitions of terms? Okay, well, that leads us right into the types of loans. We just talked about FHA and VA. There are a few basic types of loans um, that you want to make sure that you understand and are aware of because they impact what the borrower is able to do. Oops. The first one is called a conventional loan. A conventional loan. And this, this is the predominant share of what all loans are in the United States. Most loans are conventional loans. Now, let's back up one, one second. All loan guidelines are set by uh, the, the federal government. It's called the FHFA, the Federal Housing uh, Finance Administration. They control lending guidelines in the United States. They say what we can all can and can't do, the things that we have to look at for borrowers to make sure that they are qualified borrowers. Uh, there's a four letter word that you wanna remember when it comes to lending, um, and that's R-I-S-K, risk. Everything about mortgage loans is about risk. How likely is someone to pay back or not pay back the loan that they receive? That's all, that's, about, that's all that anybody cares about because at the end of the day, no one knows this consumer. This is just, these are just, that's not to be cold or harsh, but no one knows a borrower from Adam or Eve. They don't know who they are. It's all about risk. How likely is it that the, this borrower is gonna pay back the money that they are given? That's why every guideline that the federal government has created has been established to, to minimize risk and to determine the risk of lending someone uh, a loan. There are two places that these guidelines come from. There's a private sector and there's a the government sector, meaning who's going to underwrite and secure and um, make sure that the borrower meets the guidelines that have been set. The biggest market for that is called the conventional loan. That's where the vast majority of loans fall into. This is, these are private market loans, meaning there are guidelines that the federal government has established, but then these loans are bought and sold and traded on Wall Street in the private market. These, guide, these conventional loans have loan limits, meaning you can't go above a certain dollar amount to, to be classified as a conventional loan. 
the standard loan limit across the country right now is 510,400. That's not a purchase price, that's a loan amount, okay? So to be qualified as a conventional loan, the loan amount cannot be more than 510,400. And that loan amount, that max loan amount changes every year. It's gonna change in the next couple of months. It will likely go up to close to 530 or 540. But right now it's at 510,400. Um, to be qualified as a conventional loan. It's determined by county because there are some counties that are high cost counties. For example, most 95% of counties in the United States, the $510 limit is the max loan amount that you can secure for a conventional loan. Yes, Jesse. Look, sorry, Chris, I just had a quick question. I will unfortunately have to leave the class soon. I just want to ask, is it going to be recorded and posted on YouTube? Uh, just, I don't know. He usually does record it, yes, and he usually does post it. Um, okay. If he doesn't, I can always send out slides, but he likely, he usually always records these. We have multiple recordings that this, he can send out. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, every county is different, so the, the max loan limit is 510, but there are some counties that are called higher cost counties, which is very common in California, um, and that conventional loan limit is increased substantially to six, seven hundred thousand dollars for because it's hard to find a house uh, in some California counties and get a loan that's less than a half a million dollars. But that's that's called a conventional loan. It's a standard loan amount um, at the max that you can go. The second type of lo loan is called this FHA that I just talked about a second ago. And these are federally insured loans. They're they're not private market loans. The federal government insures them. And, I, and they're also driven by county limits. And I put four, a few counties here in Utah, and you can see the limits are vastly different. And these are counties that are very, that touch one another. Um, and the loan limits for an FHA loan are drastically different from one county to the next based off of a bunch of government factors. Um, and this, the same thing is applicable in California. The loan limits um, in different California counties are vastly different depending on which county that it's in. Um, but those are the two primary types of loans we do, conventional loans and government loans. And the first type of government loan is an FHA loan. Yes. When you say it's federally insured, is that for the buyer or is that for the lender? It's for the lender. Great question. Okay. That goes back to that mortgage insurance we talked about. Who is providing the mortgage insurance on the loan? Is the federal government or is it the private market? That kind of determines the type of loan that it is. But yes, both loans are technically type are insured, but they are insured for the the, the lender, not the borrower. Okay, thank you. You got it. The next one's called a VA loan. A VA is a Veterans Administration. It's for veterans. It's available for any U.S. military veteran, whether they are active duty or had served. Usually, you have to serve for at least four years in one of the four branches or the five branches of military to qualify for a, a VA loan. Uh, the great thing about VA loans is there really isn't a loan limit, and on VA loans, they are 100% financing loans. You do not need a down payment for VA loans, and they have fantastic interest rates, as they should. The government really, and these are backed by the U.S. government as well. If you are a veteran or were a veteran or served, and you have benefits, and most veterans do, a VA loan is absolutely the best way to go to, to get a loan because it's 100% loan. You do not have to have... Um, you do not have to have a down payment. And you don't have that mortgage insurance payment that we talked about if you don't have 20% down. So it's a huge, huge benefit to anyone that's a veteran or currently serving. The next one is called a jumbo loan. So we talked about these low limits. What if you what if you need a million dollar loan, right? You're a high-end buyer and you need a loan that's over that loan limit. Um, that's classified as a jumbo loan. Um, a jumbo loan is a private market loan. The interest rates tend to be a little bit higher and the, re the restrictions and the guidelines are much more intense because obviously the risk factor is much greater. It's much more risky to lend on a million dollar loan versus a $200,000 loan. So the borrower has to be qualified even more with a bigger down payment, with better credit scores, more reserves than on a, on a regular traditional loan. We have something called a non-QM or a non-traditional loan. Those are loans that uh, are, are that don't fall within the regular government guidelines that we all have to follow. These are loans like uh, where we can't verify someone's income, and so we use their bank statements to qualify them. 
or they're not technically a U.S. citizen. Um, they're a permanent resident alien. They don't qualify because maybe they don't have um, a social security number. So it's called an ITIN loan. There are all types of non-QM loans. They're not very common. Uh, we don't do a lot of them because they're very stringent. Um, Non-QM loans are the loans that really got the, the last housing crash that happened back in 2008, 2009, um, was a result of a lot of non-QM, non-traditional loans. So as a result, they completely went away for a decade. They've slowly come back, but they are a small, small percentage of what we do uh, and what's done in the, in the, in, out of the mortgage market. Any questions about any of these loan types? Okay, so these are just terms you want to remember. And it's important because they, they do have different underwriting guidelines and there are different things that you have to do. For example, when you if you ever do an FHA loan, there's an actual addendum you have to have the borrower sign versus if it's a conventional loan. So your contract is going to be different if it's an FHA loan versus a conventional. And your brokers will help you with that. Um, but that's why the communication you have between your lender is critical. You need to make sure that you are communicating with your, your borrower's lender before you make offers to make sure that you're on the same page, to make sure that you're writing the right kind of offer, that you know exactly what kind of financing they're getting. You know whether they need lender credits to be able to qualify. You need to know how much they do qualify for. It's critical that you have that symbiotic relationship with your lender because otherwise you'll, you'll make mistakes and you'll look foolish in the eyes of the agent on the other side of the transaction. Um, so make sure you're communicating with your lender. Preferably, obviously, we want that to be in Spiro so we can guide you and help you to make sure that you write those offers the best way. Last thing is there's, we talked about fixed rates versus adjustable mortgage. The loans were the rates fixed for the entire life of the loan versus those that are adjustable. 90s are fixed rate loans right now um, because rates are so low. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and Jeannie Mae, these are, are three of the federal agencies that control the conventional loan market. So we talked about the federal government dictates all guidelines. Um, the federal government insures FHA and VA loans. Conventional loans are insured in the private market. However, these, these are called um, government-sponsored agencies, meaning they're not private organizations. Fannie, Freddie, and Jenny, we call them for short. They're not private, they're still controlled by the federal government, even though they are run as private enterprises and they dictate all lending guidelines for us. So you'll hear that a lot. Fannie, Freddie, Jenny, you'll hear those terms a lot. All right, let's talk about some out-of-pocket expenses. Let's move to a different topic and talk about out-of-pocket out expenses that your clients um, possibly can expect as they start the loan process. Number one, uh, obviously your outside of the VA loan, uh, your client needs a down payment. And the more down payment they have, the better, the better terms they're gonna get, the better interest rate they're gonna get, the easier the loan process is gonna be. The minimum down payment requirement on a conventional loan is 3%. On an FHA loan is 3.5% is the minimum down payment requirement. Typically people on conventional loans are putting five plus percent down, at least 5%. That minimum of three, you have it has income limitations and loan limit limitations. So typically, people are putting at least 5% down on conventional loans, but the more they can put down, the better. And some of the, and the down payment can be gifted to them from family, doesn't have to be just their money, but the more that someone can put down, the better. So that's one of those questions you want, pre-qualifying questions you wanna ask is, do you have a down payment, right, as a borrower? Is it coming from you? Is it coming from family? If you don't have a down payment, there is still an op opportunity for them to qualify for something that is very hard because they are limited drastically on loan amount and on income for no down payment loans, unless it's a VA. In California, it's really hard because those restrictions make it to where you can only find a house that's maybe $300,000. And that's very hard to find anywhere in Southern California, a house for $300,000. In Utah, it's becoming more difficult, but it's still possible uh, for people to get no down payment loans um, on some down payment assistance programs. Um, so down payment is gonna be a requirement and that just depends on the borrower how much they have. There will be some closing costs. Closing costs um, are fees that are associated with securing the loan. The only fee that Inspiro charges is that 1290 fee I told you. But there are additional costs that are gonna, that the borrower is gonna have to incur. The, the vast majority of those are the title or, or uh, escrow fees that are associated with closing the loan. Those costs 
are part of the of this part of the down payment requirement for the borrower. Um, sometimes a seller will agree to pay those on behalf of the borrower, and that's something that you can negotiate when you're making offers. Right now, we're not seeing that so much again because it is a seller's market. When it's a buyer's market, sellers are much more um, agreeable to paying for the closing cost that the borrower has to pay. There will be some inspections and an appraisal required. This is the one thing that the borrower has to pay for upfront. Um, it is not part of the final closing of the loan. If a borrower wants to have an inspection done as part of due diligence on a property, which we always encourage that they get one done to make sure there aren't any things wrong with the house, an inspector is going to require them to pay that. It's not part of the loan, um, but it's, it's the best insurance policy they could buy because it tells them if there's anything wrong with the house, the, the major plumbing, electrical, foundation, roof, things you want to make sure are okay. Inspections costs are, are in the two to $500 range, depending on what kind of inspection you're getting. And that's something that the borrower will have to pay for upfront for an inspector to do. If it's nothing that we require a part of the loan. The appraisal, however, is part of the loan and it is required to get an appraisal when any, anytime you secure financing. And appraisals cost anywhere from $500 to $800, depending on the type of loan and the type of property they're buying. Um, and that is something that is typically paid for in advance. We do not require it at Inspiro on purchase transactions that it can be paid in advance. We collect it at closing. Many and most mortgage companies require that the buyer pay for that upfront uh, before the appraisal is ordered, just so that you know. Um, as I mentioned, all of these things can be gifted, meaning they, you, if a borrower does not have a down payment or enough of a down payment, the funds for the down payment can be gifted. The cost to pay for the closing costs can be gifted, but they can only be gifted from a blood relative, a parent, a grandparent, a direct blood relative, a sibling um, is where that can be gifted to them. So if they don't have the 5% or the 10% down payment they wanna put, a family member can gift it to them and we have to document that a certain way, but it's okay. Because it's very hard these days. And we see this more and more um, because home prices continue to, to get more expensive and it's harder for younger couples or families to have a, a full down payment. And we see funds being gifted all the time. So that's definitely a question you'll wanna ask. Lastly, DPAs, that stands for Down Payment Assistance, Down Payment Assistance Programs. Um, those are available in certain cities and municipalities and counties. Um, that's, that's associated with uh, no down payment loans. Not a huge market for that, uh, but they are available and something you want to talk to your loan officer about if you have a client that needs that. Any questions about out-of-pocket expenses that your client can expect upfront throughout the process and at the end of the loan? All right. All right, now let's go through the steps, the actual steps um, of what your client can, can expect as you start to work with them. And step number one, as I mentioned, is borrower, before we're gonna start looking at houses, we've gotta get you pre-approved. Well, you'll hear this term pre-approved versus pre-qualified, and they are different. Um, pre, they're kind of synonymous, but they are different. And you wanna make sure your client gets pre-approved. Pre-approved means the mortgage company has taken an application with the client and reviewed all their financial documentation to make sure they are approvable, that they are good to go. They've, um, they've done a thorough due diligence on them to make sure they are solid candidates. A pre-qualification is a much, it's kind of a, a watered down version of a pre-approval. The loan officer or mortgage company has likely spoken to the client, taken their information, but has not verified any of the information. So the difference between the two is verification. A pre-approval has verified the information the borrower has said. I make $100,000 a year. Let me verify it through your pay stubs and tax returns that you make that. Versus a pre-qualification, I'm just going to assume that you make $100,000 and take your word for it. So you can see the difference between the two from a, a, a real estate agent is you really want a pre-approval because you do not want to put your name on the line and your neck out there if the loan officer or mortgage company has only taken an application and spoken to the borrower and has not verified anything, because that really means nothing. Because unfortunately, clients tend to elaborate and not tell the full truth, not on purpose, but they don't know what is required for lending. And they may say, yeah, I make $100,000 a year. And we get their tax returns and they're self-employed. We get their tax returns and they only show that they make $20,000 a year because they write everything off. Well, guess what? We have, they don't make $100,000 a year, they make 20, but in their mind, they make 100. So they think they're telling you the truth. That's where that verification process is so critical 
and be the difference between someone being able to buy a house and not buying a house. So you always want a pre-approval. Number one, you want your clients to get fully pre-approved versus just pre-qualified. The part of that process is there's some things that we're going to look at to get someone pre-approved. The first thing is we are going to look at someone's credit score. We are going to look at their credit report. We are going to look at their score and see what kind of history they have. The higher the score, the better. Um, that, the credit score range is from 350 to 850. You'll rarely see anything at that extreme, but the higher the score, the better, meaning we like to see credit scores in the mid to high 700s. Um, you can get loans in the mid to low 600s. Their interest rate is impacted. Your interest rate is impacted every 25 uh, from, from once, you, once your credit score is a 740 and above, the interest rate's the same. It doesn't matter whether your score is a 740 or an 800, you can get the same rate. But every 20 to 25 points that it drops below 740, your rate's going to get impacted. Ching, to ching, to ching, meaning at 740, let's say you could have gotten a, a 2.5% rate. If your score was 720, you may get seven, a 2.6% rate. If your score is 700, you may, you may be a 3% rate, and so on. The lower your score goes, the higher your rate goes, okay? So we want to make sure we look to see what someone's score is because that's going to determine what they qualify for. Oops. Um, your, your credit score is based on five factors. This is the kind of syllabus. This is the grading model for what your score is. This is applicable for everybody. 35% um, of your credit score is based on your payment history. Do, the, do these borrowers pay their stuff on time, yes or no? Pretty simple. Are you responsible and pay your stuff on time? 35% of your scores is based on whether you pay things on time. 30% of your score is based off of uh, the amounts you owe on your credit cards. Believe it or not, you have to have at least two or three credit cards to have a good credit score. If you have no credit cards, you are missing out on 30% of your score, your potential grade, right? Think of, think of your credit score as like a class, a college class or high school class. And the professor shows up the first day and says, here's the syllabus. Here's what you got to do to get an A. Here's what you got to do to get a B and so forth. And this is what we're showing you. This is the syllabus. This is what your, your grade is based on. 30% of the grade in the class is based on your payment history. 30% of the class, the grade in the class is based off of what you owe on credit cards. That seems kind of crazy. Why is 30% of my credit score based off my, my credit cards? Because a credit card, unlike a car loan, is a variable fluctuating amount that you can owe and spend, right? You can use your credit card, pay it off, use it, pay it off, use it, pay it off, versus a car loan, you borrow a fixed amount and you, you either make the payments or you don't, and that never changes. Um, on credit cards, 30% of your, your score is based off of how much you owe in relation to your limits. Meaning if you have a credit card and it has a thousand dollar limit, the more you owe on that card, the lower your score will be. We never like to see people owe more than 50% of the limit on their card to, keep, to maintain an optimal credit score. The minute you owe more than 50% of your allowable limit on your credit score, on your credit card, your credit scores are going down, just so that you know. Uh, if you owe more than 70% of the limit on your card, your card is considered maxed out from the credit bureaus, and your scores really start to suffer if you maintain a credit balance of above 70% on your, 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 your card. Even if you pay your, your card on time all the time and never are late, if you maintain a balance greater than 70% of your credit card, your scores will be impacted. So we, we tell people you need to have two to three cards and try to keep the balances below 50% of the limit on those cards continually to maintain an optimal credit score. Um, and this is the whole class we teach on credits. So I'm just giving you a brief overview, but there's all kinds of do's and don'ts, but 30% has to do with the credit cards. 15% has to do with how much, how long they've had credit. So if you're a 21 year old kid, you're not gonna have as good of a score as a 45 year old person that has had 30 years of credit because we wanna see the length of time you've had credit accounts. That tells us that risk factor that we talked about. 10% of your score has to do with how new and recent your scores are, or excuse me, your credit accounts are. We'd like to see credit accounts that you've had for many years rather than accounts you just barely opened. Uh, the newer the account, the more risky a borrower is. So 10% has to do with um, your credit profile and how, how long you've had accounts. And then 10% talk, we're looking at what types of accounts. We like to see a breadth and depth. We like to see multiple types of credit, car loans, student loans, credit cards, houses, boats. More, the more expansive someone has, it gives us a better picture of how likely someone is to pay something back. 
going back to that 21 year old, if they've never done anything and they have a car loan and that's it, we don't have a very big credit profile to determine whether they're risky to lend to. And therefore their credit score is gonna be impacted. They're not gonna have the highest scores possible. Um, and that's something they can do about that because that's just an age factor and a time factor that will, that will be in their favor as they get older. But these are the things we look at that determine credit scores. Um, this is the syllabus that determines whether your score is you know, between 315 and 15. Any questions about them? Let's see, someone put in a question or chat. Uh, oh, great. Okay. Whoops. Any questions about uh, credit, the credit profile? Okay. Um, second thing we look at, credit's number one. Number two is income. Let's, what kind of income does the borrower have? Everything in lending is about a two-year history. We want to see everything that's gone on in this person's life the last two years. We are going to deep, we're going to know everything about them and get every piece of information we, we can on them over the last two years. That's what that's the critical point in lending is what's going on in their lives the last two years. So we need to have a two-year history with, with employment. Someone has to have at least a two-year history of employment or they do not qualify for financing. If someone has not been working and then all of a sudden gets a job tomorrow paying them $100,000, they will not qualify for a house until they've been working for two years. They've got to have a two-year history. Now, there can be some gaps, meaning someone could have worked um, for 10 years, then uh, was a mom and took five years off to raise their, their little kids, then decided to go back into the workforce. She doesn't have to be back at work for two more years. She just needs to be back on the job for six months because she worked for two years prior to having kids. She has a full two-year history. There was just a job gap there. But if someone has, does not have a two-year history, because it's usually a factor of age, because they're younger, they've got to have a full two-year history to work. And people can change jobs. They don't have to have the same job for two years. They can move around and change jobs. That's OK. We just don't like to see big gaps in, in, in employment. But we want to make sure they have a two-year history of employment. Um, we're going to ask them for their most 30 day, recent 30 days of pay stubs to, to verify the income. That's part of that pre-approval process. Um, trust, but verify, we like to say in, in lending. Trust what the client's telling us, but let's verify everything they're telling us. So we want to make sure that we got 30 days of pay stubs. We're going to ask them for their W-2s for the last two years, 1099s the last two years, K-1s the last two years. We're going to ask them for their tax returns for the last two years, all the pages and all their schedules, because that can impact their income. If they're self-employed, we're going to ask them for their corporate or the business tax returns for the last two years. Again, we're going to know more about them than their family knows and their best friends know about them. Intimate details that they usually aren't, don't share with people. Unfortunately, we have to ask this private and sensitive and sometimes uncomfortable information from a lending perspective. And this is something you kind of want to let your clients know about that, hey, to get pre-approved for a mortgage, you're going to have to provide a lot of personal documentation. That's just the way that it is. Um, and just be prepared for it. So this is, a, this is a standard list of things that we ask for people from an income standpoint. Now we're going to talk, we've mentioned this DTI in the, in the acronym page, the debt to income ratio. Let's talk about what that means, because this is what determines what someone qualifies for. We look at their credit scores, they have good credit. We look at their income, they have good income. Now we got to determine how much of the house can they qualify for? What determines how much, whether someone qualifies for a $200,000 mortgage or half a million dollar mortgage? It's based off of their debt to income ratio. So let's do an example of this. Let's say that someone makes $10,000 a month. We verified they make $10,000 a month in pay stubs, W-2s, tax returns. And they have $2,500 a month in payments, meaning we've looked at their credit report and they've got a car loan for a couple hundred bucks. They've got a credit card they paid a hundred bucks on. Um, they have a student loan they're making a $50 payment on. Um, so that's, that's totaling a few hundred dollars. And then they have this house they've looked at. Um, and that house payment based on their down payment is another $2,000 a month. So the total amount of debts that they have going out the door, showing on their credit report, plus what the new loan is, is $2,500 a month. We divide the $2,500 into the $10,000 and it gives us a debt ratio of 25%. We're not looking at groceries or gas or miscellaneous expenses. The debts we look at are the things that are appearing on their credit report, plus what the new house payment is going to be. 
that gives us their total debt. And we divide that into their income and it gives us a debt ratio. We don't like to see debt ratios above 40%. So in this case, we wouldn't wanna see someone's total debts and house payment to exceed $4,000. Now, can someone's debt ratios go above 40%? Yes, particularly on um, government loans, on FHA and VA loans, we can often go up to as much as 50% debt ratio if they have good credit scores. Um, but we like to keep it below 40% because it impacts their, their interest rate. The higher the debt ratio, their interest rate could be impacted. So this is how we determine whether someone well, how much someone qualifies for. Because we start plugging in numbers. We start putting in a $200,000 loan amount versus a $400,000 loan amount, and we get a debt ratio. And that tells us exactly what they qualify for, if that makes sense. Uh, we kind of back into it once we know their income. So once we have all this information, we can make sure that the house they qualify for doesn't exceed that 40% debt ratio. And we say, Mr. or Mrs. Homeowner, you qualify for a $400,000 loan based off of your income, your credit scores, and your debt ratios. That's the max amount you can go and secure a loan for. And then we will share that with you and say, hey, your borrower can only secure a loan for $400,000. They have $100,000 in down payment, which means your purchase price needs to be around that $500,000 mark, no, no more. So that gives you as the agent that framework of what they can buy. Does that make sense? Um, again, I put an, an asterisk down here of what the mortgage consists of, the PITI, the principal interest taxes and insurance, and mortgage insurance if it's applicable if they don't put 20% down. Okay, the documentation that we're gonna need as part of this pre-approval process. Um, we talked about all the income documentation that I mentioned a, a second ago. As far as the assets, we need to verify that they actually have, in the example I just said, let's say someone had $100,000 of down payment, they said, we need to verify they have those funds. Um, is it a, a gift coming from someone else or is it sitting in some bank account, an investment account, a retirement? Where is the money coming from? As I mentioned, we have to document everything. Because of the housing crash and meltdown of 2008, 2009, the mortgage industry is the most overregulated. And I use that term honestly. We are the most overregulated industry there is based on federal requirements. We have to dot every I and cross every T exactly, or the loan stops in the split tracks. It's, it's frustrating um, for you and a consumer. We make it as smooth and as painless as possible. But it is a little bit of an overkill from federal regulation. And so we have to we have to document and so much stuff. It's crazy. So from an asset standpoint, we're going to ask them for all kinds of bank and asset accounts to make sure that they um, qualify and have the down payment. If they were divorced, we're going to get a divorce decree. If they had bankruptcy, we're going to get bankruptcy papers. If we're going to ask also then get their ID to make sure they are who they say they are. These are the basic things that we're going to ask from every borrower. Um, as we get them pre-approved to make sure we trust but are verified. Once we've done the pre-approval process and we, we send you a pre-approval letter, I should have put an example of what that looks like, but once we pre-approve your borrower, we're going to email you a letter from us on our letterhead that says, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Homeowner are pre-approved to buy a house. And here's our, doc, here's our form that says that. You, you want that because anytime you make an offer, any seller is gonna require that they see that your borrower, your buyer has been pre-approved. If two people submit an offer and one has a pre-approval letter in it and one doesn't, they're gonna take the one that had the letter in it because they know that that client is pre-approved versus one that doesn't, it's too much of a risk. So we're gonna send you a pre-approval letter so you have that in your file and you can submit it with any offers that you make. And once you do that, now we kind of pass the baton over to you and the house hunting starts, that's where you you start showing them properties, listings, open houses. You start taking them all over town to find the house that they want. This is this is all you, right? Um, this is, we're going to send you the letter. That's critical. If you don't have it, you're going to be at a huge disadvantage, particularly in today's market, if you do not have a pre-approval letter when you're submitting offers. Um, a couple of things that you want to review um, on your REPC, on your purchase contract, is section 1.2 talks about items that are included in the contract. Um, lend, and this is very confusing because a lot of times agents will want to include a bunch of stuff. I want to include the swing set and the, and the 
the trampoline in the backyard. I want to include the hot tub that's on the patio. I want to include uh, the grandfather clock that's in the living room because that's really cool. My buyers want it. And you put that all in the contract. Well, guess what? We're going to make you take it right back out again because we cannot take a contract that includes private property. The only thing we can lend on, the only thing that we can determine value on is the house itself. So don't include all that kind of funny stuff. Now, appliances are different. They're considered a part of the property. Window coverings, drapes, that's different. They're part of the property. Um, you can put that in there, but any personal property outside of that, you cannot have. We're going to make you take, we're going to make you take it out. So it's a pretty common thing that we see, particularly our new agents putting stuff in there. So just don't put that in section 1.2. Closing costs. We talked about there's closing costs uh, associated with the loan. You can ask the sellers to pay the buyer's closing costs if you want. Very, very common. The closing costs are $3,000. You put it in, in an addendum on the contract. Hey, we're going to offer you $340,000 for this house, but we want you to pay $3,000 of the buyer's closing costs. You can do that. That's fine. And you'll put that in an addendum. Um, very common in today's market. Section 24 of most contracts have to do with deadlines. Um, that's super critical. Um, the deadlines on the contract, meaning when your inspection deadline, due diligence expires, when the financing and appraisal deadlines are coming up, and when the closing and settlement deadline comes up. This is where you want to discuss things with your loan officer of what kind of deadlines you should put. Things are taking longer right now. This year, 2020, is going to be the largest financing year in the history of the United States. We are on track to fund $4 trillion of loans in the United States. It's massive, yes. It's, we've never seen anything like this. It's, and it's mainly because of rates are all-time lows and it's the biggest refinance year we've ever had. Um, but we're, we're on pace to fund close to $4 trillion. It's, fr it's frankly too much. The, 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 mark, the mortgage market and the secondary in Wall Street can't handle it. We couldn't continue that pace forever. It needs to slow down. It's been great, but it's, it's too much to, to be able to provide good turn times and service. But as a result of that, it's like trying to put too much water through a, a hose. It can only hold for so long before it bursts. Um, as a result, things just take a little bit longer than normal, and you need to prepare and prep your client. We typically try to get things done between 20 and 28 days on purchases. Um, really good companies can get things done in about three to four weeks in a normal market. Right now, you need to add about a week or two to that. You know, 30 to 45 days for a purchase contract is wise because there are many things that in the mortgage uh, space that we don't control, like the appraisal. The appraisal can take two weeks to get back, and we have no control over that because everyone has to go through a central federal system to order appraisals, um, and that just causes delays. So the contract deadlines, you want to speak with your loan officer before you start putting in dates and holding, because the last thing you want to do is put in dates and then speak to the loan officer, and he or she says, are you crazy? There's no way that's, that's possible. Then you got to go back to the selling agent and say, whoops, I goofed. You need to uh, make an addendum to the contract. It just doesn't make you look good, right? So make sure you're communicating with your loan officer on your contract deadlines to make sure um, that you're putting deadlines that are that are realistic and your client understands those. Okay, loan documentation. Now you're you're under. You found the house. You put them under contract. Now let's get uh, let's get going on the loan. Um, some of the documentation things. We're going to be we're going to process the loan. That's once you submit us the contract. Um, and they're under, they're under contract, you send, send us the REPSI, we're gonna to start to process the loan. We can't officially do anything until we have that. Uh, the processing phase of the loan is we're gonna gather all the additional documentation that's necessary. Um, and there's literally 101 things that we have to gather uh, that are required for an underwriter to review. We're gonna lock in the borrower's interest rate as we talked about to secure it, to make sure that everything's okay and that's not gonna change. We're gonna send out disclosures. We're going to e-disclose. That's part of that loan estimate, that LE that I talked about. When a borrower gets under contract, we have to send them an initial set of disclosures within three days. Uh, and we typically do that via e-disclosure, via email, so they can e-sign. Uh, and we have to do that within three days. We're gonna order an appraisal. Once the disclosures have, have been signed and come back to us, we're gonna get the appraisal. We're gonna order a title policy, uh, get those things worked on. We're gonna order their, their homeowner's insurance, their hazard insurance. We're gonna order a ton of third-party verifications. We gotta verify their employment. We gotta verify their assets. We gotta verify their income. 
We have to get tax transcripts from the IRS. That's another thing that takes longer these days. There are a ton of things that we are required to do in this processing phase. Every bar was different, so there could be unique things to that bar that we have to order that's uh, based on a case-by-case -case situation. Then we're gonna review, review, review. As I mentioned, we have to be precise with lending, and we're gonna make sure that all these things that we're ordering are coming back, being ordered precisely in a timely manner. That's the processing phase of the loan once the client is under contract, and that's the first phase. The next phase in, in the loan documentation part is underwriting meaning the processor gathers everything together and kind of puts it together in this nice package and submits it to an underwriter. An underwriter is the person who's legally authorized to review the file and make sure the client meets all the federal lending guidelines and that we have all the documentation that supports that, okay, that the processor has provided. There are four C's of underwriting. Number one is the credit. We review the credit to make sure that they qualify from the credit standpoint. Collateral. Collateral means the property. We're going to review the purchase contract and the appraisal to make sure this property is, um, is eligible for financing. Meaning if this home is about to fall to the ground, right? Or it has tons of safety issues, or there's a hole in the roof that the seller is not willing to repair, we cannot lend on that property. Um, the borrower has to be, excuse me, the property has to be habitable, has to be safe, has to have certain requirements. And that's called the collateral that's going to be reviewed, as well as the title policy is part of the collateral to make sure there aren't liens or judgments that need to be satisfied. Compliance, there, as I mentioned, we are super over-regulated. So the underwriter is going to make sure that we did the loan compliantly. Um, and there's a whole, that's a whole other discourse of what that means. Capacity, we're going to make sure that the borrower does qualify and can support the payment. That's that debt to income ratio. Can the borrower make the payment? on this property based off of their information. Those are the main four things that an underwriter reviews on every file that comes in there across their desk. Once the underwriter reviews it, they're gonna, um, they're gonna make sure, yeah, the client's good, or if there's any conditions that we need to satisfy, they're gonna let us know, and the loan officer's gonna gather that additional documentation, and they're gonna say, yep, finally, you're good, this borrower qualifies, you're cleared to close. Then it goes into the closing and funding stage, um, will we begin working on the closing documents at least seven days before they're scheduled to, to sign their documents? Um, we issue that CD, that closing disclosure, has to be issued at least three days before closing. It's not issued until after the loan, the loan's been at least approved by the underwriter. Um, once we have a clear to close, once the loan is totally approved by the underwriter, we'll then reach out and say, okay, let's set an act, exact day to, to, to sign, closing day to sign the documents with the title company or escrow company. Again, we have to wait at least three days to, do, to actually sign from the day the CD was signed. So if we issue a CD on Monday, we can't close the loan at the earliest until Thursday, three days later. That's part of the, the compliance regulation, one of those silly new rules. We have to send the, the final closing disclosure to the borrowers at least three days before they're allowed to close and sign their final documentation. Uh, we typically send funds in advance of the title company, meaning the day of or the day before, so that everything is there ready to go for the closing date. Uh, we let the title or escrow company know when the funds can be dispersed, and then note that promissory note can be recorded, um, and all documentation uh, are returned to the lender, meaning we, we do not allow a loan to be finished until we have verified everything's been signed, everything's done properly, and we have it back electronically. We don't have the original, but we have to have emailed copies back to us that we can review. Once we have that, then we let title and escrow know. Now you can disperse the funds. Now you can record the loan. Um, now the thing can be finalized. And now you can give the borrower the keys. And you're done. Well, that was a lot of info that we've covered here in the last um, little over an hour. Um, lots of information overkill, uh, lots of information that, uh, that helps you kind of understand the process that your client's going to go through. Um, we could have dove in deeper, and it's, these are usually more effective live because we can have lots of interaction and lots of questions as we go through this because you likely have those. Um, but I want to open it up right now for any Q&A that you might have. Any topics, any issues, any scenarios that you're experiencing right now? that you just want to know about or need to know about that we've discussed and reviewed.
have a question. What's your cutoff time for funding? So funding is based off of, so when we say funding, that means the loan funds are going to be wired um, to the Tyler escrow company. Uh -huh. uh, cutoff times, funding, wire times are controlled by the federal government because it's a federal wiring system um, of when funds can actually go out. So there's an actual time every day that everyone has to adhere to. I mean, funds but they'll be sent out. They can be sent out. Typically, that's about two o'clock Pacific, three o'clock Mountain. So it depends on where you are. So on, you're on the West Coast, you're at a little bit of a disadvantage versus if you lived on the East Coast, because the East Coast cutoff time is, you know, four or five o'clock in the afternoon, right? Because it's a, fed, it's, a, it's a common federal system that is applicable coast to coast. Um, but typically, the last time we can possibly send a wire out is two Pacific, three Mountain Standard. Um, Perfect. Where most funds can go out. Good question. Okay, thanks. What else? Any questions you have about the process, loans, what you need to do, what the client's going to be asked for, types of loans? Yes. I have kind yeah. of a situation. Um, I'm working with a, a potential client. He wants to purchase a piece of property. Uh -huh. All that's on it right now is a garage. There's no home on it. But he tells me that everywhere he goes, there's, there's something like a stipulation he's got to build on it within five years. Have you ever heard of that? Typically, that's the case. Um, that, that would not be considered a, a, a mortgage loan. Right. It would be considered more of a lot loan or a land loan. Even though there's a, a structure on it, it's not a single family. It's not a, it's not a dwelling, right? Right, it's right. A garage or a shed. So um, whenever you get a lot or a land loan, those are usually short-term loans, meaning they're amortized for 30 years, but the, the loan has to be paid off within three to five years because right. the bank or credit union doesn't want to keep that forever. Um, and you typically have to go to an actual bank like a Wells Fargo or a local community bank to get that type of a loan. And they are going to require that you build on it within a certain amount of time or they're going to call the loan due uh, right. because those are not long-term loans that banks or credit unions want to keep. So yeah, that's very, very common. Um, and so typically when people get those types of loans, they're looking to build pretty quickly. Right. Uh, if not, they have a plan in place to do so within that five-year period. All right, cool. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. What else? And I know there's maybe things you, you don't know what you don't know yet. If you have a, how many by show of hands have, have gone through the process of a buyer? Have any of you gone through the process of dealing with a buyer? A few of you? Okay. Um, the rest of you, you know, it'll be your first rodeo, your first go around. Um, and whether you've done it once or two times or you've done it a thousand times, um, you really want that relationship with your mortgage company and the loan officer that you like is just so critical. Um, it, and it determines a lot of your success because the, the work that the mortgage company and loan officer does reflects on you. It's an extension of you. It's an extension of your business, of your brand, your profile, uh, of how the client views you because if the mortgage company makes a mistake, you know, they're going to blame you, right? And that's the harsh reality of it. And that's why it's so critical you have a partner like Inspiro that understands that relationship. Um, and we know that everything we do reflects on you. And so everything we're doing is to make sure that we're promoting you, to make sure that the client has a great experience um, and they get to the end of the, of the road of their contract and they're sitting there with their keys. Um, listen, Lending, as I mentioned, can be a little bit messy sometimes. Every client is different. Um, even though the guidelines are, are standardized, every situation is so different. Um, and what, what you can do for one client, you may not be able to do for another. Um, and our job is to make sure that we make that experience as smooth and as pain-free as possible. So it's a positive experience, uh, particularly that we're informing them and are completely transparent. They don't most clients will do this a handful of times in their life, unless they're an active investor. They'll only buy a house you know, one, two, three times in their life. Um, and so they have no clue of what to expect or how this works. And we need to make sure as a financial institution that we are totally transparent in everything we're doing. We walk them through the process. This is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. This is what we need from you. This is why we need it. We're never gonna ask them for stuff that we don't need because we're gonna ask them for so much stuff anyway. The last thing we want to do is ask them for more information. But that's where that trust factor comes into play. 
because you're basically handing your commission check over to us and, and entrusting us with that commission check because we got to get the file to the finish line. Once you get under contract and you have uh, turned it to us, not that your job is done, but you you kind of lose control in a way, right? The, the deal doesn't close unless we do our job um, and we get to that, that finish line and get everything finalized uh, in a timely manner. So that relationship is so valuable to you. Uh, and the more that you understand it, the more you understand the process, the things we're gonna ask and why, it just will make you a better agent because um, your clients are gonna, they trust you. You know, they're coming to you for a reason. Uh, they like you, they believe in you. Uh, and the more that you come from a place of, of love and compassion, but also authority, the more they'll continue to trust you. And then whatever snafus happen, because there will be snafus that happen, I can guarantee it on every deal. It's not a big deal. You know, it's, it's a little bump rather than a mountain to overcome. And they're going to be patient. They're going to understand. And we're going to work through it. We're going to make sure we get, uh, get everything taken care of. So um, we love our relationship with Everest. It's, it's a mutually beneficial relationship we, that uh, we've had in place for a while. Um, the, there's a reason that we're here. There's a reason that Everest uh, puts us in, in this position um, and why we have it. Uh, I would encourage you to take advantage of it. Uh, if you haven't already in California, you know, go to our office. It's in the Westlake office. Meet the, the team. Reach out to our manager there. Uh, get to know them. They come out to the offices. They're, they're on base camps all the time. Um, you're a little bit more restricted. Uh, we're not seeing as much in and out activity. People working from home a lot more in California than we see in Utah. But try to get out and meet people um, in our team, and you'll get to make those relationships. In Utah, we're much things a little more open. Um, but the same invitation is there. Come to our offices, say hello, get to know our team. Uh, we're involved in, in pretty much everything that Everest does. And the whole purpose of Inspiro, the whole reason we're here, just so you know, this is what's very unique about us, is the only reason we were created was for this relationship. Um, we don't solicit business outside of Everest. We get it because we're good at what we do. But our 100% of our focus um, is on Everest. So all the things that we do, all the, the ways we do it, is to help you and your business to make it a better experience for your client and to make it a better experience for you. So just know that we're here for you, whatever you, whatever you need for open houses, for flyers, for marketing support. Um, we're here to help you be as successful as possible uh, and to make your clients want to come back to you and refer business to you. Um, any other questions that I can um, answer for you uh, before we... Uh, Call it a day and give you back an extra 40 minutes. Okay, well, it's a pleasure. Uh, did you have a question there? Uh, I do. Juan Carlos, how are you? <laughs> Good. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, quick question. Um, first time buyer with maybe a year and a half to year uh, work experience. Huh? Uh, is it, uh, you know, what, what kind of uh, documents do they need? What kind of um, approval rate do you have on the, that kind of situation? Yeah. If they, if they should, so are they young? I mean, yes. not, they're young. So yes. first thing is they, they have to have a two-year work history. They got to get that two-year work history. So if they've had a year and a half on the job, they really need another six months on, on the job to, to work. The only caveat to this is if they were a full-time student. If they were a full-time student and we're going to school full-time and we have to document they were full-time student and then graduated and then started working, we can count their schooling as work history so long as they're working in a similar field that they went to school for. Okay. So if they went to school to be an engineer and now they're an engineer and they've only been in an engineer job for a year, we can count their schooling as quote unquote work history for their two year history. But outside of that, they have to be working for, for two years. So as long once they get another six months under their belt and they have the job for two years, then it's just a matter of what does everything else look like? What does their credit look like? Do they have a down payment? Yes or no? Um, and then how much can they qualify for? But that's and the, if they're if they're still in school, um, does that have any? If they're still in school. Yeah, it doesn't help. Yeah, they've got to have it had they would have had to be finished with school uh, for us to use that as work history. All right. Very good question. Yeah. Yeah. One question to follow up with that too. So does it have to be the same consecutive job or can they have two, three, even four positions? Yeah, it can be different jobs. Yeah, it's okay. 
as long as they have the history. And we don't like to see people bouncing too much, meaning if someone has changed a job every two or three months for the last two or three years, that's not stable, right? And, we, and they may be required to stay on their current job for six months to show some stability. Even though they've been working for 20 years, if the last two years they've changed the job every two months, um, they're, they're likely gonna have to keep the job for at least the six months to show some stability. But if it's just, if they've had a job and then they just barely changed, they had a job for two years and they just changed the job a month ago to a new job, fine, they don't, that's no problem. Totally okay. It's a great question. Any others? Well, feel free to reach out uh, to me or anyone on our team with any questions. Um, again, I'm pretty sure this has been recorded if anyone wants to access it, but uh, pleasure to see all of you, meet you all via Zoom. Um, best of luck with, uh, with the rest of your week, the rest of your month, and we hope to establish a great relationship and help you out anywhere we can. Thank you. Thanks so much. You bet, take care.